uh, nonetheless, I will uh, briefly introduce um, our guest to the, to the audience. So Professor Simon Marginson, Marginson is a professor of higher education at the University of Oxford, director of the Center for Global Higher Education and joint editor in chief of higher education, one of the leading journal in the field and lead researcher with higher school of economics in Moscow. Uh, Simon's research is focused primarily on global and international higher education, the contributions of higher education and higher education as a public and common good, and higher education and social inequality. His recent books include Higher Education in Federal Countries, edited together with Martin Karnoy, Isaac Frumin, and Oleg Leszuk, Leszukov, uh, and also second book, High Participation Systems of Higher Education, edited with Brendan Cantwell and Anna Smolenceva. Uh, our second guest uh, is Xin Shu, who is uh, also a co-worker um, working together with uh, Professor Marginson. Um, she is a research fellow at the Center for Global Higher Education, Department of, Department of Education, and the junior researcher fellow at Kellogg College, University of Oxford. She has strong research interests in the internationalization and globalization of higher education and academic research. Her doctoral research investigated the internationalization and evaluation of humanities and social sciences research with a focus on the influence of incentives for international publications in Chinese higher education. The thesis won several awards, so congratulations um, are in order. Um, and finally, um, as um, Professor Marginson's and uh, Xin Shu's paper will be followed um, by some comments and remarks by um, our colleague from Scholarly, uh, Scholar, Scholarly Communication Research Group, I finally would like to introduce my dear colleague, Christian Szatkowski, uh, who is a researcher here at our group uh, and assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy of Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. His interests cover Marxist political economy and transformations of higher education systems in Central Eastern Europe, as well as the issues of the public and the common good in higher education. Uh, Christian is currently working on a book about political economy of higher education, so um, definitely, um, definitely this is something we are waiting for. Um, just a final remark before I pass the voice um, to Professor Marginson and um, to Xin Shu. Uh, during the discussion, uh, please raise your hands and we will grant you voice. So uh, please use the, the application um, for uh, letting us know that you would like to pose a question. Uh, all right, um, we can begin. Um, Professor Marginson, Xin Shu, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Jakob, for that nice introduction and, um, you know, scholarly and comradely uh, way you've brought us into, uh, you know, into into today's uh, seminar. Um, I want to uh, really thank Emmanuel and uh, Christian for uh, staging this show. Uh, it's a really interesting topic and it's a great to have the opportunity to share with everyone uh, some of the work we're doing on global science. Uh, I guess we came into this work on global science, like many of us who are sort of, you know, working with, in a theorized way with social uh, and economic issues, but this feeling that scientometrics was producing these really big scale uh, mathematically based studies of global science using bibliometrics, and this was very interesting, you know, we hadn't, didn't have this until recently, and this is kind of uh, quite powerful, but there's also this, uh, you know, as with all positivist work, bold claims, uh, strong mathematical methods being used to uh, skate over some very complex uh, political economic issues and problems, uh, no philosophical depth, uh, no theorization or not much, there's a bit, uh, and, and that feeling that, uh, you know, global science needs theorization, needs to be situated in a, in a larger historical and philosophical framework to be really understood. So it's with that spirit of wanting to use scientometrics without being bound up in its limitations that we've gone into uh, this work. Now, it's a very important to do this sort of work, I think, because, uh, and I think we begin to screen share at this point, Shin, if we can. Um, the, the last, uh, uh, let's see if I can get the option to share. Mm -hmm. I can control the screen. Thanks, Shin, that's great. That's great. Yeah. I'll just set, set, set this up for myself. It won't be a moment.
Okay, so now in the last three decades, global science has um, uh, centered on universities and research institutes has been transformed in many respects. Um, science has become larger, it's become more global, it's become much more networked and more distributed and diverse. It's less Euro American centric than it used to be in relation to who spends money on science, who builds science systems, who produces science. Yet it's changed little in other respects in its language of use and in the formation of scientific agendas. It remains Euro American centric, monocultural in its form and content. Now, since the internet began in 1990, world science has expanded with a network logic electronically mediated information and communication systems grow more rapidly than linear forms, extending towards every possible connection while intensifying relations between the existing nodes. Global science has evolved as a dynamic open communication system, autonomous and emerging organization in its own right. Between 2000 and 2018, papers in Scopus increased by 5% a year, meaning that the recognized codified global science is doubling every 15 years. The proportion of papers with authors from more than one country grew from 2% in 1970, 14% in 2000, and then 23% in 2018. And there's also been a great growth in the number of science countries with their own infrastructure and engaged in the network. Science is no longer the monopoly of scientists in the Anglophone zone, Western Europe and Japan, Russia. In the 30 years after 1987, the countries that contributed 90% of papers in the bibliometric collections rose from 20 to 32. Now this includes many that are, are countries with below world average per capita income, like Pakistan, Indonesia, India, Colombia, there's been especially dynamic growth of autonomous science in China and in middle-sized science systems such as South Korea, Iran, and Brazil. And India, which has a per capita income less than half of the world average, is now the third largest producer of science. It's ahead of the Germany and the UK in total papers published each year. Now, of course, science is not wholly global in character. I mean, primarily, perhaps it's not. It's ordered, regulated, funded, and housed in national science systems and in individual institutions, such as universities and research institutes. And this is the platform on which global science papers and network collaboration have evolved. Science everywhere consists of two distinct and coupled systems, heterogeneous to each other, the global science system and the national science systems from which the global science system has evolved. Now, by global science, we mean the pool of globally net recognized publications, nearly all in English, and the collegial networks, autonomous and regulated by professional scientific norms in which knowledge circulates and scientists work together. The purpose of the global system is simply to produce and circulate knowledge. Scientists bring to bear on their work individual and collective goals, cognitive cultures, knowledge, imagination, associations, beliefs, habits. Studies of science discuss the motivations of collaborators, including cognitive accumulation, building knowledge, uh, the drive to be on the cutting edge to make the great discovery, but also things like friendship, proximity, cultural affinity, shared values, and preferential attachment which is the one theorized idea that really comes into the sinometrics literature, the potential for status and career benefits to be gained by working with other scientists, sort of positional good or positional advantage idea. Scientists are not necessarily bound by affiliation or nationality. They mobilize across countries and they move freely between disciplinary global science and their national and institutional settings. And often their disciplinary loyalties are primary. Now, national science system is not only focused on science, of course, but it's also focused on the prosperity and security of the nation. So the global science and national science are different. 
They have different drivers, different rationales, different values, but they also provide conditions for each other. Nationally funded and organized people and infrastructure are essential to global scientific co collaboration and output. At the same time, the growth of global science has been a great stimulus for national science, driving national investments in university research so as to most effectively use the global science network. Nations must keep up with developments in global science, but nations and their scientists do not do this on an equal basis. Following up with the discussions about global sciences and national science systems, uh, we came to the understandings of the network analysis of global science. So this framework of global science as an open space misses some dark spots. That includes the connections that, that are not made um, and translated conversations and valued knowledges and agents outside the global network. In general, the networked global science space is characterized with structural inequalities and cultural homogeneity. There are two forms of inequalities. First, the exclusion of knowledge in languages other than English. And the second, uh, the accept expectation that universal global knowledge is framed by primarily Anglo-American cultural norms. In terms of the language, we could see that English dominates global science, especially in the codified sciences in bibliometric senses. Around 5% of the world's population speaks English as their first language. However, English is the sole global language of science. And as a result, of 2,000 years of British, American, military, political, economic, and cultural primacy over the world. In terms of the codified science indexes, English journals account for around 90% in the most influential databases, such as Scopus and Verb of Science. The low proportion of non-English journals is a result of selection and exclusion. And it does not reflect the publication volume of those journals in the non-English languages. If you look at the table on this slide, this is evident in the comparison of the English and Chinese language academic journals. The number of them and the proportion of them included in the Scopus and Book of Sciences. The dominance of English also demonstrates in other ways, such as lower citation counts of non-English publications, the asymmetrical translation patterns. Um, almost half of our scholarly translations are from English to other languages, while only 6% are from other languages to English language. All these create eight language barriers for researchers whose first language are not English language as compared to their English speaking counterparts. Moreover and more broadly, global science is culturally configurated. Euro-American and primarily Anglo-American organizations control the processes of knowledge formation, circulation and codification. This is shown in the concentration of resources, editors, peer reviewers, intellectual property laws, and disciplinary standards in global science. The homogeneity of language, norms, and knowledge is powerfully advanced by the leading Ameri Anglo-American universities. So global university rankings enable various criteria, but they are all grounded in the profiles of the top US or UK institutions, such as the indicators include papers in English dominated indexes. Anglophone universities then occupy the top positions on world university rankings. And in this way, the global university rankings redefine 
reaffirm and recycle the Anglo-American control of science. Also, the homogeneity is reproduced in the day-to-day -day institutional practices and in the autonomous professional habits of scientists. The scientists around the world are put towards a familiar hierarchy and the dominance of certain research agenda, epistemological strengths, and research paradigms and questions. Ministries and universities in different non-English speaking countries or non-Anglo-American countries try to internationalize research by incentivizing publications in internationally indexed journals, usually English language journals, or, but however, the internationalization is a double-edged sword. Theories and methods must be reworked in those publications and in those science uh, productions for the Anglo-American templates. And local and national agendas and questions are displaced by the so-called global topics, which is often localized also to American society. There's a price here. The price of cultural uniformity is the loss of diverse knowledge, including the endogenous knowledge. At the moment, the polarization of global science means that China, South Korea, India, and others have become better at doing Anglo-European science as benchmarked against at the Anglo-American criteria. However, non-Anglo-American systems and people have more agency than either the bibliometric collections or the center for referee model would acknowledge. But in the codified sciences, those systems and people exercise their agency only on someone else's terms. So there have been transient critiques, especially from non-English speaking and post-colonial countries. Critical scholars adopt different positions. Some of them reject the existing science as wholesale and asserting alternative knowledges as an act of decolonization. Others don't intend to abolish the monocultural science, but argue for its dethroning and supplementation by knowledges previously marginalized, ignored, or invisible. And many scholars want a broader inclusion of voices, localities, and knowledges. And common to all is the desire to advance subaltern agency. So how then are these unequal relations of power in science theorized? Well, in studies of science, the most influential idea of global relations is the center periphery model developed by world systems theory, primarily associated with Emmanuel Wallerstein. Wallerstein sees all nations as incorporated into an expanding Euro-American world system, grounded in the capitalist world economy and based on a three-way division of labor between countries at the world center in the US, parts of Western Europe and perhaps Japan, which have strong states, and he makes strength of states a decisive um, categorization between his different groups of nations. Then there's nations on the periphery where the states are endemically weak or non-existent, controlled completely by colonial powers. And there's also those in the intermediate semi-periphery, such as, as he names them, China, South Korea, Russia, Australia, other parts of Europe and so on. Countries in the periphery and the semi-periphery are locked into position. It's very difficult in Wallerstein's world to move from one category to another. This is because he says that there's a limited political economic surplus at world level and the world system imposes a zero sum competition between countries in terms of power. He translates the idea of um, uh, the limited surplus in relation to the class relationship between capital and labor into a world system theory. Further, he says, 
agency at the periphery is suppressed by the fact that peripheral economies are captured by foreign capital, which blocks development. And center periphery theory came out of development studies in Latin America, which could point to the, the role of foreign capital in capturing and controlling Latin American economies. Now, Wallerstein repeatedly emphasizes that very few countries on the periphery and the semi-periphery can move up through their own efforts. And he sticks to that position all the way through his career. At the same time, in world systems theory, the world level solely consists of nation states. And there's no autonomous global relations that crisscross and combine nations. So a global science system as such is impossible. It has to be controlled by the imperial powers at the center. Yet at the same time, individual nations do not have autonomy. Only the rigid mosaic of nations, the world system, is an agent. As Wallerstein puts it bluntly, there is no such thing as national development. Now, Wallerstein is not himself a Eurocentrist by conviction. I mean, he's, he's aware of the injustices of colonial, colonialism. He begins his career, in fact, in the colonial struggle in Africa. But for him, the only way out is the abolition of global capitalism. And this partly explains the wide take up of the center periphery model, because the idea of an inevitably Euro American centric world is readily agreed by those who, unlike Wallerstein, welcome Euro American domination, bask in the alleged cultural superiority of the world center, and see capitalism as not just inevitable, but desirable. The center periphery distinction is often referenced in studies of science, including social science and higher education. For example, the work by Ladersdorf and Chinchilla Rodriguez, uh, uh, Olechnika and colleagues. Altback and others in higher education studies too talk about center periphery a lot. As noted, it sits comfortably with the Eurocentric perception of the world. Also, there is obviously a hierarchy in science and universities and Wallerstein's three-tiered system does seem to fit with what people can see of the operating pragmatics of the world of research and science with Stanford or Oxford at the center. As Olich Nicker and colleagues see it, emerging science countries are condemned to permanent subordination. In their 2019 analysis, they state, core and periphery play complementary roles in the global system. The core is at the forefront for socioeconomic and technological development, while the periphery provides cheap labor. In the case of science, this is manifested by the fact that new ideas are generated predominantly at the center and then imitated in the periphery. Now, I think they're right to say that uh, science is unequal and, and Chin's um, explanation, I think, made that perfectly clear. But they overstate the problem and they diminish the scope for agency, for change. They state that individual countries rarely break the vicious cycle of lasting peripheralization. They underestimate the scope for state strategies to develop science in emerging systems. Because like Wallerstein, they believe that all states outside the Euro-American center will always be weak and subordinate. Now, when science is explained in center periphery terms, it's a poor guide to actual developments. As discussed, there are several limitations on problems when the center periphery module is used in science studies. So the relations of power, the capability and agency in science are not as fixed as Wollaston's argument implies. The world system theory underestimates the importance of national contexts and differences, and also the potential of nationally based agency to escape from the dependence trap. This is apparent when we look at what has happened in science since the theory emerged in the 1970s. And in general, the center periphery framework negates the autonomy of global relations, the autonomy and agency of nations and persons, and also the potency of context and culture. It doesn't usefully explain the rapid growth of scientific papers and network collaborations, and also the element of flatness and openness in scientific networks. 
and all these have enabled the building of scientific initiatives in new and developing science countries. Also, the framework doesn't explain explosive growth of science in many countries on the so-called periphery and semi-periphery, and that those growths emerged simultaneously without exploration between each other, as opposed to the zero-sum assumption proposed by the center periphery model. The model also doesn't explain that the rapid development of links between different countries in the periphery. And those links are direct. They're not mediated by the strongest science countries in the network. Countries do not act as gatekeepers. The center periphery theory also has no explanation for the rise of China and East Asia in science and India, which is now the third largest pro producer of science after China and US. The world is clearly not as Eurocentric as world and beliefs, especially in the distribution of the political economic strength underlying scientific capacity. And also in the distribution of outputs where scientists in China are producing more papers than scientists in the US. At the individual level, center periphery cannot adequately explain the motivations of scientists who have values in common, why do they collaborate and why is the autonomous science network so robust and alive? So finally, just as the nations are not locked by the Euro-American power, scientists as individuals and their agency are not wholly contained by nations or the framing of a peripheral status. Center periphery theory underestimates the different agencies of both emerging nations and also scientists themselves. Well, world systems theory is right about the dominance of Euro-American ideas and science, but it's wrong to think this is permanently fixed in place by global capitalism. There are two deep problems in world systems theory. First, it's wholly economically determinist theory in which culture and knowledge and science are just framed by the economic base. Secondly, the economic basis is inevitably Euro-American and primarily American control. Now, history shows that neither of these assumptions are correct. First, we have a new global political economy with the rise of the East and East-South relations becoming more important, um, perhaps than any other, in some respects, in the world economy, and with the potential trade between India and China becoming the largest trade in the next 20, 30 years in the world scene. Um, we're also seeing the strengthening of you know, many middle-income countries and former periphery countries, some of them are successfully state building. Um, and there's growing post-colonial and decolonial momentum. In many respects, the Euro-American centric world is, is passing, is changing. Secondly, global science is not entirely shaped by either political economy or neo-imperial power. I mean, it has autonomy. And more so when national governments build scientific capacity, which they want, but they don't fully control. So one of the historical questions we can ask ourselves is, you know, why did American global capitalism create this autonomous science? And I think that's a very interesting question. But having created it, uh, in some respects, it now moves beyond conditions into which it was created. Now, I think this is hopeful in some way, because it means that because of both nation building and the autonomy of science, we now have a, we could have a much greater diversity in knowledge, in global knowledge than we have had before. But at this point of time, that hope is not being fulfilled. Autonomous science is sustaining a global order in science that's more Anglo-American dominated in language procedures, topics, agendas, than is the global political economy. So the scientists, autonomous scientists, are in themselves steeped in this kind of hegemonic project. Um, and they're closing out or diminishing non-dominant knowledges. And they're doing that on a voluntary basis 
collegially organized, not being directed so by their nation states, but by doing this for cultural reasons of their own. Now, I think we need a better understanding of this landscape than centre periphery theory provides. What theory then might enable a more insightful and more open understanding of relations of power in science? We find that the concept of hegemony or hegemony um, offers a more comprehensive, flexible and supple explanation of power in, uh, uh, in science. In, it's more directly sp specific in relation to relations of domination subordination than is center periphery theory. At the same time, there's less closure, you know, less zero sum ontology. I mean, in Gramsci's terminology, hegemony means control by managing consent and participation. He emphasizes the role of language and cultural mechanisms. Although he focused on relations of class, the idea of hegemony is more broadly applied in studies of power. Stephen Lukes discusses, for example, the mobilization of bias and control over institutional processes and agendas. Immanuel Orderica refers to the processes of shaping and incorporating perceptions or cognitions and preferences into a dominant ideology, remarking that institutions play a key role in the exercise and expression of hegemony and in higher education. They sustain agency and processes, for example, journal hierarchies and topic selection, which calibrate value in science on the basis of the dominant order grounded in the leading countries and universities. This, I think, does provide a very convincing explanation of the exercise of power in science. These formulations help to explain the inside outside binary in global science, and they also suggest the potential for counter hegemonic strategies. And on reflection, sciences like most collect a collective or common goods subject to unequal power relations as previously discussed. However, the purpose of science is knowledge building, not the building of systems of power. So the question is how to democratize and equalize global science. At present, global science mainly fosters unity, but downplays the recognition of differences. The next step is to move from cultural homogeneity centered on the old world order and to something like unity in diversity or harmony with diversity and to work not with a stratified knowledge system, but with a knowledge system that recognizes and re respects the full corpus of languages, theories, concepts, methods, and knowledges. The ontology of a more diverse approach in science is well-defined. The idea of pluriversity, um, pluriversal, and diversified knowledges reoccur in the decolonial literatures. And those discourses focus on the knowledge production open to epistemic diversity. For instance, Santos proposes an equality of knowledges to, rep to replace the monoculture of modern science. And he emphasizes the interconnections between different knowledges without compromising their autonomy and without compromising the value of intercultural translations. One step towards the epistemological diversity is to move from sole reliance on global English to a multilingual publishing and translation regime. And English will remain as the shared language, but we should make every effort to reproduce the range of knowledge in diversified languages. For instance, all global field journals and the leading national language journals should be available in at least the major languages like Mandarin Chinese, Spanish, Hindi, French, Arabic, Russian, and some journals already do this. Developments in technology and machine translations could also facilitate multilingual publishing and translation. In addition, 
those translations should not be made just from English to other languages, but all languages to each other. And furthermore, the crucial agents are not the publishers or translators, but scientists, together with the collegial networks and perhaps universities and supportive governments, there could be changes that we can make. For instance, there have been initiatives like Helsinki Initiative on the Multilingualism in Scholarly Communication, and science will not come, will not move as a whole, but the path to structural multiplicity is through individual disciplines and individual actions. New norms and new expectations and new cultures in one field can be the ripple that triggers the changes elsewhere. The multilingualism would help in extending the common pool to knowledge outside the English dominated academic world. And in addition to that, much can be done on the cultural diversity of global science. The beauty of science is that it is self-regulating and autonomous. So the habits of scientists are much influential. It is true that scientists could reinforce structural injustice, but on the other hand, they can also transform it with different professional habits. Each monocultural scientist that starts with to work with different languages or draw on endogenous insights and knowledge and each editor who's curious about diverse papers and make judgments more constructively than exclusively and also each cross-cultural research groups that founded on equality and mutual respect and mutual learning or each person, each individual who thinks about what Eurocentrism means and abandons the locked imaginary of centers and peripheries. And all of these will make a difference. When all the small steps and ripples bind together, the ecology of sciences, the ecology of knowledges really begins. And okay. with this note, we'll end our presentation. These are some uh, references that we've used. And okay, Simon, perhaps you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to uh, invite now Christian to the discussion, and then we will uh, be uh, we will give you back the voice so you can respond to his comments and um, then we will move to the discussion part of our seminar so uh, Christian please um, join us with your uh, comments and remarks and once again thank you very much for your presentation okay I think that you can leave the screen shared for people to to, to uh, download the presentation I have no presentation like in the uh, visual form, so 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 this will be uh, simply useful as background if you want. Uh, in my reply, I would like to contextualize some some aspects of one of the papers that you were uh, shown, the the the, the co-author paper by uh, Professor Marginson and uh, Dr. Xu. Uh, uh, but uh, as the presentation is like like, like direct directly refer to the paper, I think it will be quite clear. So Margins and Xu undertook an ambitious and multifaceted task. They proposed a reinterpretation of the present state of uh, global science and emphasized the importance of the global emergence of China and its science system. They subjected the Eurocentric model of the world system developed in the 70s and 80s by Immanuel Wallerstein to severe criticism as well as scrutinize its application in the research of science and uh, uh, scientometrics. Moreover, they propose an alternative, not only to the conceptual model itself, its use in thinking about science, but also uh, they propose alternative to material organization of relations in global science. All of this in a single paper. Uh, due to the limited time, I will focus on few threads that, in my opinion, require some attention. 
First, I will put margins and excuse proposal in, in the context, then point to its internal tensions, and finally, I will discuss the solutions uh, to our global problems that these researchers propose. The difficulty of the task undertaken by the authors becomes apparent when we took a closer look at the context in which it is embedded. Discussions about the centers and peripheries in social sciences and humanities have been going on for decades. For the period between 1996 and 2021, Scopus database contained 18,492 papers with references to the works of Immanuel Wallerstein. At the same time, this, this uh, discussion seemed to omit both the fields, uh, fields of scientometrics and higher education. A quick analysis of the leading journals in this field shows a practical lack of interest in the subject. For the top journals in bibliometrics, like Scientometrics, Journal of Informetrics, Research Evaluation, Journal of the Association of Information Science and Technology, we can trace only 13 articles that refer to Wallerstein works, usually very superficially, with 10 of them be, uh, published in Scientometrics. The situation is not better when we turn to higher education research. The top journals like higher education, studies in higher education, teaching in higher education and higher education policy contain in total 26 articles referring to Wallerstein, with nearly half of them published in higher education. American top journals like research in higher education and journal of higher education contain no such references at all. This Reasons for such a mission of a quite important theoretical debate and historical debate uh, might be multiple. While the most convincing, at least from my point of view, is that the both fields, as already emphasized by uh, Professor Marginson, are severely under theorized and practically oriented. Uh, the few existing studies that refer to word system analysis engaged in the literature rather superficially and occasionally. While in scientometrics, the focus is more on the collaboration patterns, the higher education research focus on the flows of students and academics between the world regions. Yet the historical account of the relation between the economic structure of any given nation or region, its relationship with the global economy and the role of the science and higher education system uh, still awaits its authors. This situation produced a serious challenge for Marginson and Xu. While they rightly complain on the reductive use of center peripheries model in the study of science, with the example of Alechnitska, Plosha, and Selinska Janovich's recent book, which is, I would say, like in terms of the use of the variety and richness of what word system analysis can propose, is rather a superficial use. Uh, they themselves, the authors, engage in the critic of the reductive form of the argument and Wallerstein proposal that was itself criticized, nuanced, and expanded from all possible angles from 1979 onwards when Fernand Brodel devoted it, uh, the opening chapter of, of the third volume of Civilization and Capitalism. So, like, there are like plenty of arg uh, arguments that already were uh, formulated against Wallerstein, even, uh, uh, even by his uh, own peers from the same paradigmatic camp. So, so, so uh, this is the context for, for, for this intervention. One of the tensions in Marginson and Xu proposal is, in my opinion, proposed by the concept of hegemony that they propose as an alternative, alternative take. The authors said, like, hege hegemony offers a more comprehensive, flexible, and supple explanation of power and in inequality in science than does center and periphery model. Yet, they avoid to answer a fundamental question, the hegemony of whom or what and over whom and for what, whose interest does hegemony in global science support, who is exercising it and gaining from it. For the authors from the word system analysis paradigm, from Brodel to Wallerstein, from Arigi to Frank, hegemony is a natural, natural reference point and it's included in 
plenty of, uh, of books as a simply standard uh, aspect of the world system model, capitalist world system model. And it's not an alternative conceptual take. It is, as Arigi uh, written in his long 20th century, the power of a state to exercise functions of leadership and governance over a system of sovereign states. Uh, it was exercised by Venice, Low Countries, Britain, and the US. The Chinese peaceful ascent in the East Asia opened a huge debate within the world system analysis uh, circle. Uh, the debate on historical difference in exercising hegemony by China. And this is like mainly covered by by book by uh, Andre Gunder Frank, Reorient, uh, and uh, Arigi's uh, Adam Smith in Beijing. While the end of the US hegemony in the world system was discussed from the onset of the war in Iraq, there is a lot of unclarity in terms of whether rising of the Southeast Asian region will step, uh, rising Southeast Asian region will step into global hegemonic shoes or contribute to the formation of bilateral world arrangement. Changes in the structure of global science and recent ongoing autonomization of China from Anglo-Saxon or Western influence may tell us something about the na nature of the process. From the world system analysis point of view, the so-called rise of China both in economic and in scientific terms, is nothing but a return of China to its historical role and position in the global order. And this is like clearly visible in, in the book by R.E.G. and writings from the 19th uh, onwards about the East Asia. Uh, Marginson and Xu, uh, in their paper, with a quick reference to Hart and Negri's empire, would like to move us beyond the question of in easily indicated uh, single word hegemon. And I think it's like, like, like a right move to do because uh, in the period of a uh, uh, general crisis of US hegemony, there is no single, single state entity that leads the world forwards. This is unclear situation. But even for Hart and Negri, about 20 years ago in empire, that they quote, as well as in recent uh, Commonwealth and Assembly, the global form of diffuse network-like sovereignty serves directly the interests of capital against the common term or, or multitude or in human language, uh, we can say against the democratic and horizontal forces and tendencies globally. Their thesis, Hearts and Negris, on the emergence of the empire serve the purpose of arguing that contemporarily there is no outside to the rule of capital. In that way, they located themselves not so far away from the world system terrorists who traced originally the historical emergence of the capitalist order in the West, but then further on problematized this, this origins. But once again, this is exactly something that Margins and Xu would like to refute. Yet this leaves the fundamental question open. If global science is an autonomous order, as they claim, and we can better understand the de negative power gains that traverse it through the prism of diffused concept of hegemony, then what and whose interest does it protect? In other words, it coerces whom by whom and produces concept, consent to what? Uh, and I think that uh, the, uh, the, the, the proposal, uh, which is more articulated in the paper, and here was much more nuanced in the, 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 the direction that I would absolutely support, uh, is understandable when we refer to this idea of translation from English as a common language uh, to support the rise of ecol uh, the ecology of knowledge and rise of diversity. We can understand some further tensions that the lack of the answer to the above question, that question about the uh, subject exercising hegemony, uh, by looking at one of the author's proposal to the yields of homogeneous global science, the multilinguality protected by the translation of science outputs to the set of dominant languages. On the one side, Marginson and Xu rightly indicate that in the situation of Anglophone dominance, 
in the global science, not just the language is imposed on the global users and producers of science, but also specific cultural forms of written outputs, methodologies, and other cultural underpinnings. In other words, even as lingua franca, English is far from being value neutral medium for science. On the other side, the authors propose, propose it uh, to remain a dominant medium from which translations will be provided by the capitalist publishers, dominantly Western, out of the profits they make from global knowledge circulation. Uh, this proposal highlights the important problem of the global science that need to find a solution. And I, uh, uh, I'm in support of any effort that would uh, propose a so solution to that. And I think that here we have at least a problem posed. And the uh, problem is culturally specific form of knowledge circulation and valuation that is now shaped predominantly by the actors external to the field of global science, the eligibility of capitalist academic publishers. And this must be overcome if science is about to gain its autonomy. Recently, China has made a, crush, a crucial step beyond their rule, expressing the will to refrain from heavy reliance on impact factor publications uh, in its academic evaluation. However, we need to understand what economic and geopolitical conditions allowed China to make such step. Uh, and I think this is like one of the thing that we need to look for and where the, there is a chance for productive cooperation between insights from within the reflection on science and higher education and from within the world system analysis. Marginson and Xu emphasize that science has bigger potential than just reproduction of global inequalities. And I cannot agree more with them. Uh, they would like to restore the conditions for unity and diversity to provide the global knowledge production systems with the conditions for democratic prosperity and polyvocality. I share their values and goals. In 1998, Ander Gunder Frank uh, opened his reorient global economy in the Asian age with the following words. There is unity in diversity. However, we can neither understand nor appreciate the words uh, diversity without perceiving how unity itself generates and continually changes diversity. Marginson and Xu leaves us without a concrete idea on how we can make sense of the deep material factors that underpin both the global science and national sciences and diverse cultures of the world. For this reason, I think that they dropped the world system theories and the 50 years of debates and contributions uh, to that debate way too early. There is still a chance for a productive, productive meeting between, between the two. And while I support a, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, critical insights from the authors of the, of the both paper, uh, of the paper, I think that there is a, like a larger tradition which we can still find some, 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 some hope in it to support the claims and political goals that uh, we three uh, and probably most of us here in this Zoom room share. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Professor Marginson and Dr. Shu to respond to Christian's comments, and then we will move to uh, discussion section. So, so back to you. Shina, I'll start if that's OK, and, and you come in. Um, yeah, look, uh, uh, really valuable um, comments. Really appreciate the comradely way in which they've been made as well. Um, and um, I agree with you about the tradition. You know the, the you know the debates and the discussions and the uh, the immense insights that have been gener generated in the development um, theory argument um, and uh, around world systems theory, Frank and others um, and Hart and Negri, Negri in particular. I would mention. Um, you know. And you know, and the and the debate with the Anal School, and I mean, all of that is really immensely interesting. And I I'm steeped in that stuff myself. Um, and of course, we don't set that aside, that discussion, that and that tradition. But uh, but you know, I think that it's amazing how things change. You know, the reality forces it forces us to address 
the new situation like in 1914 you know it's it, it it and it divides us and it forces us one way or the other and then we then we work out what happened um i mean heart and negri it's a really powerful book you know empire and um it's but it's a book written in the late 1990s and this is the high point of anglo-american globalization where the submerged state in the us is still a big player of course on the world scene but it's it's demolishing and it's deconstructing the states everywhere else to create freedom for global capital and that's american capital um and uh, and so the project is all about the rise of the of of the the network society and and the decline of the state uh, and how wrong that's turned out to be, you know, how incorrect um, in two respects. I mean, one is the military state and the state of sort of national security and, you know, daily advances its position now, but that's been coming since 9-11, since 2001, really, hasn't it? War on terror it was really the beginning of that phase. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I mean, I mean also that the, there's that sense in which the periphery, and the semi-periphery struck back, you know, and uh, and and it was state building that enabled it to move forward. It wasn't in any way following the neoliberal Anglo-American globalization model politically. It was, and it was within the constraints of capitalism. It was pursuing the rise of the semi-periphery and the periphery. And of course, that state building project has not been universally successful. And there's lots of ways in which places where it hasn't started. Uh, and uh, but there's also lots of places where it has uh, happened and it changed things. So the Hart and Negri view turned out to be not quite right in some crucial respects. And um, and I think you know we need to and you know that's another discussion you know about globalization than slightly different to the one we've had today. But I mean I mean I think we have to be able to say things turned out to be differently to what we expected and why, and and, and address that. And this is what we're trying to grapple with here. So we're certainly not seeking to throw out the tradition but we're seeking to, you know on the on the on the on the marxist left of that discussion about global capitalism i mean it's clearly central we are posing the question of um autonomy of science as a kind of cri critical point and i think that's one we can usefully tease out further in this short discussion we're having today um but we certainly don't uh, you know don't break you know break continuity with the, with the debate up to now um but I think your question is really nice. You know, you say hegemony, you know, you know, for what, by whom, and so on. Well, I mean, clearly, science, if we carry through our argument about the autonomy of science, then we have to look at scientists and say, who's exercising hegemony there, for what, how, and so on. I, I mean, I think what's happened is that um, American science really designed the global science system. It was American universities that came out of the early um, establishment of the internet in the strong position. I mean, those universities were early adopters in the 1990, 91, 92 period. Uh, and they were, their um, faculty um, culture, their habits of association free of the state, generally speaking, operating in ep epistemic communities through collegial networks, but quite hierarchical networks, academic networks in the US, uh, but independent of direct regulation in many respects. That, that approach became the world science approach. And it turned out to be, immensely beneficial to create a more open and in some respects horizontal system at a world level. Um, and, and that was, and that's enabled a lot of countries to develop their scientific capacity more quickly than might otherwise have been the case. But, you know, the challenge is now there. American science is being whipped into line by the American state. It's been told you've got to break, decouple from China. You know, you've got to enter the geopolitical American project, which is to contain China, to have another Cold War. Um, and, and so the pressure's on the Americans to, will they continue their scientific collaborations freely, autonomously across the world, or will they start to diminish their ties with China and others who might be in the opposite camp? And they won't just be China. So uh, we haven't yet seen that, that change play out yet, but that's going to test our argument about autonomy. And what I'm, the message I'm getting from my American colleagues is that we're determined to maintain our relationships with China. This is what the peak American universities are saying, Harvard, Yale, and so on. They're saying, we, we have a lot invested in collaboration with China. We think it's in the world's interest to do this. It's in our interest to do this, and we're going to continue to do it. And that's running straight up against the American state at the moment. So this is very interesting. And so this will test the autonomy argument. Um, uh, but, you know, I think we need, we need to support 
the autonomy of science in that context. And, uh, and you know, because science, the potential of science for horizontality and openness and, and its capacity to move outside the constraints of states and capital is, is enormously important. But even, and we need to fiercely at the same time critique, I think, the hegemonic and unequal nature, the cultural bias and so on within that science system. So that's the double kind of critical task we've set ourselves to do. To, to, to sustain the autonomy of science, but to criticize the forms in which it's, cultural forms in which it's being expressed. Um, I think you're right too uh, about the potential of bibliometrics and publishing to intervene in science. And I think I see this as an the emerging issue. I mean, in some respects already global science is constituted by commercial bibliometrics. Uh, and that's one of the sustaining forces in its, the exercise of cultural hegemony, the inequality is enforced by Web of Science and, and Scopus. Um, now they do that in consultation with the peak of the scientific communities, but they're also doing it themselves uh, and quite, and you know, with through their own power. And um, uh, trying to shift into an ecology of knowledge's project is, is will ramp against that constraint. So um, there's that basic point that science itself is in a, in a, in a sense of codified science is being, is being commercially, if you like, framed, although the commercial framers don't determine the content of science. And that's the really important point at this stage. But there's the greater danger that the publishers will start to do that. And I think that I've actually been in some consultations with Taylor and Francis recently, where we're developing this idea that they can have a sort of social science publishing where the um, socially science trained workers working for Taylor and Francis will operate in place of journal editors and, and constitute um, field discussions, which will go not be within disciplines or within the existing framing of subdisciplines and topics and so on, but will in fact run according to a commercial logic. So this is a kind of new publishing system that's a little lurking there. Um, the only obstacle to that is that it's not credible amongst um, academics and universities at the moment, but if, it, but if enough of them were bought off or attracted to it, it would start to work and they would become more wage labor, presumably for this, they would start to pay peer reviewers and so on as wage labor as peace workers in this framework. So there is a danger that wage labor and capitalism could directly start to produce social science. I don't think that would be so easy in physics, but you know, social science could be the point at which this struggle will occur. So I think, I think that you know that that the autonomy of science is fragile, but you know, it's it's done an awful lot as well in a short time. So that's a, a hopeful sign. Um and uh and and you know I think that that's a cause worth fighting for if you like. Shin, I've taken a lot of time. I should hand over to you. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Christian. I think what you were commented and Simon's responses all have really valuable points, and I do echo Simon's points on a lot of senses. And for that, for those, I won't repeat. Um, I think there are some really valuable questions in Christian's responses, and to continue with the discussion of how capitalism. Uh, creates and uh, dominates the global publishing and global sciences. I do agree that the tensions and the paradoxes exist on a larger scale than what we have acknowledged or not have acknowledged in our paper. For instance, the same tensions exist for the initiatives for open science, for open access, where on the other hand, where on one on the one hand, uh, the open science initiatives could facilitate like open and more equal science spaces and to uh, pr to give knowledge a more public good role and position. However, on the other hand, the open access and open science are usually monitored by the profit profit making publishers and companies and are turned into their profit making uh, mechanism. So the paradoxes exist. And this, as Simon commented, I think is another form of the cultural hegemony in the global science, not in terms of the geopolitical senses, but in terms of the ideological senses. And another thing I would like to comment on is the is your point about the China's recent retreat or the uh, kind of change of directions in terms of their uh, attitudes towards global sciences or globally recognized science criteria or benchmarking criteria. So I think this is a really interesting question. Um, 
and there are like lots of questions that we could ask what kind of geopolitics that are in play, what kind of um, cultural norms that are behind this. So my quick responses would be that um, China's retreat or the seemingly retreat from using uh, SCI, SSCI citation indexes in evaluations um, and also the central government's reject of worshiping the international publications or English publications. It's kind of a resistance towards a previously overdue um, worship on the international size or the Western size, as we see in the global science. And there, it, it was done due to an intention to strike a balance between international, internationalization, and also nationalization or indigenization or endogenization, what we call it. Because at the moment, although there's strong policy rejection towards worshiping as a CI, uh, the internationally used indexes are still in use and in the evaluation systems, there's an intention to keep a balance of both domestic publications and international publications, domestic knowledge and international knowledge. So it is not like either in international or retreat, it is kind of a both and way. And also this was contextualized in, contextualized in the geopolitical tensions between the um, US in the past year and also in the COVID-19 pandemic situation. When, when the pandemic first occurred, there have been many uh, publications from China in English languages and in English journals, whereas the governmental focus at that time was to uh, have more practical knowledge that could be used. Um, so that was kind of the behind that what that was kind of the factors behind the changes but I would say that it doesn't mean Chinese scientists will stop collaborating with their international partners and the Chinese universities uh, will stop collaborating or participating in global sciences uh, also because the previous previous worshiping of international indicators also created some uh, what we call fraud uh, sciences or uh, unethical practices. So this kind of retreating action is also trying to make adjustment to this and trying to strike a balance between producing high quality sciences and also maintaining the academic integrity. Uh, my last comment is on the use of hegemony and the concept of it. Um, so I think what Simon and I were suggesting in the paper is that hegemony as a concept may be more flexible and open and not as fixed as the center periphery uh, normatives. So what we were not arguing that the hegemony should be the kind of, you know, the practice or the reality that we're aiming for, but it could be used as an explanatory tool to explain the reality of global sciences. It was not a normative appeal. And I very much agree with your questions about the agency, the um, manufacturers behind the new or the not new, but the world in terms of the hegemonic perspective. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you all for your contributions. Uh, I think that already some really interesting topics emerge for, for, from, from this uh, discussion. So I think this is the great introduction for a wider uh, discussion among um, all the participants. And at this point, I would like to invite the audience um, to um, pose some questions and also respond to um, to to the discussion. So uh, if you have a question, please uh, raise a hand. Uh, all right. Uh, first, uh, Franciszek Krawczyk, uh, Franek, uh, 
the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm, I'm Franciszek for also from Scary Communication Research Group. And thank you very much for, for your paper and for, for your presentation. It was like really, really inspiring for me. Uh, especially, uh, I appreciate focusing on, on hegemony because uh, I think it, it en enables us to, to post some more practical questions, not, not about how dysfunctional is the whole system and the whole global economy, but also practical questions what we as academics can can do and and can can change to to um, be able to uh, fight for some more more equal uh, more equal environment. But but my question my question is is that like because uh, because you at the end you uh, you propose this alternative this uh, ecology of of knowledge and and that which I understand is some some kind of counter hegemony and what Christian little, little mentioned I would like to uh, uh, maybe a little more, more elaborate uh, is is that uh, what are the some material conditions for to, to be part of some of this kind of counter hegemony of this kind of, of ecology of knowledge because when I think about uh, you what what you describe in, in your papers or in your talk, uh, you 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 mentioned China or uh, countries in in Latin Latin America, uh, and uh, and there we have all uh, great fundings in in China or like in Latin America we have a really uh, high population of of people speaking speaking the same the same language, which is like I think a powerful base. For, for creating counter hegemony. And when I think, for example, about the Eastern Europe, we, we don't have both, like, um, besides of Russia, but like in Poland, in Hungary, or in Czechs, like, we have very different languages, which are uh, not speak, spoken by, by many people. We usually don't have much fundings. And uh, what are the conditions to not be like left behind in this like counter counter hegemonic like movement thank you yeah really interesting um questions aren't they um you know i think there's there's a lot of advantages for in being bilingual if you're talking about national system i mean you think about finland you know this is a good science country really smart really effective system with good global participation and you know from time to time very effective in terms of cutting edge problems. Um, all of my colleagues in Finland have this tremendous conversation in Finnish with each other all the time. You know, they have this strong sense of, uh, of, uh, of cultural identity and, uh, and their language is rich and it works, you know, in terms of um, exploring the issues they want to deal with. Uh, and, but they're at the same time very bilingual. They can shift into the kind of uh, European and global conversation. In fact, they're multilingual, of course. Uh, with many people having several languages in European context. Now, but I think that that's that, you know, like one language is being used for kind of um, collective um, organization and other languages are used for communication. And I think this is kind of interesting um, in, in this what, different ways in which people move between cultures in a multiple sense. So I think that, you know, that maybe that's a material condition to be effective at global level is to is, um, is, is, is the plurality of languages and particularly the relationship between different languages and the division of labor they play in your uh, relationships and in your um, material production. So uh, there's something there, which is not just about money. But I think your point that, um, you know, the large cultural sets can constitute this sort of multipolar world, you know, which will be the next stage beyond the English world, you know, the Anglo-American world is right in the sense that, you know, Chinese is very big, uh, Russian's pretty big. Uh, Latin America with Spanish and Portuguese, two languages complicating things, but basically very large zone of people and very large language groups and um, at world level. And, uh, you know, lots of uh, scope for division of labor and sharing and uh, and so on, you know, within those frameworks. So the, yes, it, it constitutes, a, you'd say the big language groups are going to um, also, you know, play another kind of role in terms of plurality to the role that Finnish plays in Finland, where it's constituting the identity of a small about seven million people um so uh, yeah so i think you do you know in other words i think you work with you know you, 
with the with the options that history has given you. You know, you kind of work with the framework that you're born into and um, uh, and and the options that open up. But there are different ways to, in which to develop the College of Knowledges. Um, and um, uh, I guess that the Ecology of Knowledge's idea, of course, is, you know, you know, utopian in one way. It's kind of a, a norm to be achieved rather than to be realized immediately. But uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's also, um, you know, it's a, it's a counter-hegemonic or it's not exactly counter-hegemonic. It's more sort of non-hegemonic, isn't it? Um, you know, it's arguing for uh, equality of respect, particularly, I think, Santos, who's really an important thinker, I think, was creating a basis whereby indigenous knowledges could enter the discussion, you know, endogenous knowledges, knowledges that are not Europe, part of the European, uh, Euro-American heritage, the, the, the knowledges of the colonized peoples and others who have been outside that framework. And uh, the assumption being that, you know, in many areas, particularly ecological maintenance, there's really important things that we all need to know about. Uh, and, and, um, and this is, the College of Knowledges is designed to de demolish the binary of inside, outside, colonize, non -colonize, colonizer, and so on, so to move beyond that, that, that idea. So it's a sort of uh, very much pitched against all kind of hierarchical forms and hegemony of any kind is a form, is a hierarchical form. So, so we have this complicated dance, I think, whereby we're attempting to pursue this democratic project at the same time as trying to constitute alternative centers of power, you know, which, uh, which start to fragment the, the hegemonic um, power. And that's not an easy project to reconcile. Um, but I think you're right about materiality, you know, in the sense that you need some, you need basic resources to constitute science, especially, and probably even social theory, um, you know, of the kind which we're engaging in now. I need certain amount of resources and, and time is the most important one and the capacity to work together uh, is conditioned by those resources. But um, uh, my sense is that the good thing about intellectual work is that there's so much scope for agency, you know, it's, I mean, I, I buy into the Margaret Archer argument about agency and structure, then that they're heterogeneous, that they're not the same register, that they're different aspects of reality. Um, structure is absolutely very much there. And, and you know, we, we deal with it all the time, but agency is variable and it, in relation to structure. And um, in areas like science and knowledge, we can advance enormously in an in genteel sense within material constraints. We can achieve a lot. We can have this kind of conversation and actually change what we do as a result of what we say to each other. And that's really powerful. So, I mean, especially in social theory, social science, we have a lot of agency. So wherever we're coming from. Um, so I, I do think that's really important and we should, uh, there are a lot of reasons for hope. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sheen or Christian, would you like to add something to, 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 to the question? Okay, and um, then uh, I would like to invite uh, Simon Warren to pose his question. Hi there. Yes, it's uh, Simon Warren from Roskilde University in Denmark. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not really a question. It's more an observation, if that's okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was. Uh, I have many observations, but I will focus my <laughs> my contribution. Um, I was interested in your uh, selection of uh, hegemony as a, as a, a concept that, uh, that could organize uh, a different uh, take on the, the situation of global science and its futures or possible futures. And I just wondered why you focused on hegemony rather than uh, perhaps focusing on Gramsci's concept of conjunctural analysis, because to me, hegemony is, is incredibly useful in this context. And, and hegemony, you know, as Christian pointed out, is, is uh, utilized by uh, scholars working within the world systems analysis tradition. But uh, to me, hegemony uh, allows us uh, uh, to, uh, perhaps kind of think about the, the possible forces for change, but it doesn't really tell us what the relationships are between, for instance, the, the, the broader political economy of the context and the, the kind of 
uh, more semi-autonomous cultural and social forms and formations. And so while you were talking all the time, I was thinking like you, you were talking about, in a sense, kind of providing uh, uh, evidence as to why uh, world systems analysis uh, had some inadequacies, some limitations in analyzing the, the current situation. But thinking more in terms of a conjunctural analysis uh, of uh, what is of trying to understand the specificity of the current moment uh, in its detail, I kept thinking of uh, the kind of some of the political economy that kind of sat behind some of the things that you were pointing out. So you were talking, for instance, about the the uh, the exponential growth in, in scientific production and distribution uh, beginning in the 1990s, uh, you, you, you kind of identified a particular point in time. And I was thinking there about the, the, uh, the other phenomena that you have written a lot about that's been really important in terms of the, the growth of mass uh, and possibly universal systems of higher education. But of course, these, these rest in part upon uh, the dominance of ideas such as human capital theory as an organizing idea for political economies and for the reconstruction of higher education systems, uh, whereby you know, systems have to expand to produce a, a larger stock of human capital within a, a national uh, workforce. Um, and that this produced certain kinds of change in practice in higher education at the time, including uh, the production of, you know, in, in term, also in terms of which parts of scientific activity, broadly speaking, were, were being kind of advanced more than others. So we have the kind of strategic uh, investment in, in the STEM areas. Uh, um, in terms of growing those, of making them more competitive, more active within uh, higher education systems. And of course, this partly produces a growth in scientific knowledge and distribution in certain uh, knowledge domains. And so I would imagine that the, the growth in knowledge production and dissemination that you're talking about uh, is largely led and dominated by a growth in, in, in science, engineering, mathematics, uh, uh, scientific knowledge and production. And then we have that kind of shift to a more neoliberal uh, political economy, uh, which then uh, kind of, which, which in large part simply intensified those processes uh, rather than changing them. But then we have the emergence of a parallel, another autonomous, uh, a semi-autonomous uh, system, which is that of status competition. And so status competition produces its own effects. You know, so it is, that is it. So if uh, the human capital form is institutionalized in certain funding regimes and uh, certain national measurements uh, in terms of how well institutions are doing, status competition uh, which was not led by governments, it was led largely by us uh, as academics and was led by and has been led by uh, private industry, the publishing industry mostly, um, um, you know, and institutionalized in ranking systems, which only latterly governments adopted. But this has produced its own effects. So also this, this, uh, this phenomena that you point out in terms of the growth in production of knowledge, um, is is you know sits behind that I would say are these kind of more political economic features, which I, I didn't see very readily in in your presentation. Okay, so I'll have to, to me, ask you to con conclude just, the question. This, this is my conclusion. It seems to me that rather than posing, uh, I, I would I would like pose I would pose a, a slightly different. Um, um, invitation to the scholarly community, which is that we what we need in higher education studies is not a choice between world systems analysis and hegemony, but rather a more sustained 
uh, engagement with what the, the very nuanced and sophisticated uh, developments within political science and political economy has to offer us in terms of understanding the, this as a, uh, as a conjectural analysis. Very quite quickly, because I know we haven't got much time, Jacob. Um, Simon, that was great. Um, I, uh, I think you're absolutely right about conjunctural analysis, and that's really the probably the nub of our critique of world systems theory that, you know, the totalizing character of it. And uh, the, um, you know, that the very early critique by Smith in 1979, he said, look, um, this isn't going to apply in all states in all cases, you know, you're going to get breakouts from this theory. And of course, he was absolutely right. And uh, you can only understand uh, I think global developments by, you know, through the Gramsci and uh, uh, conjunctural analysis. Um, but where, I mean, I, I think generally you're right about a lot of things, but where we part company a bit is in relation to you, I think you bought into the conventional political economy argument about the knowledge economy and human capital theory driving everything else. And I think that that's been, we took that apart in our book on high participation systems. Um, I mean, the evidence is just really poor. Uh, when you actually look at the, you know, the the um, the development of um, of uh, participation in education, the growth of of, uh, of of training and education at tertiary level, it doesn't correlate at all well with economic developments in any country you look at or in any historical period. The great surges of participation have not been connected particularly to the political economy, either in a delayed sense or in a, con in a current sense at all. Um, and um, you know, you've got lots and lots of exceptions. Uh, cases where countries have had this, like Turkey, a vast, you know, expansion of participation, no evident, you know, reason for it in the economy at all. Nothing in the in the configuration of industry structure or the use of skilled labor, which would suggest that that was driving the participation. What you said, I think, later in your presentation then was that uh, social demand and positional competition in particular, you know, status has played an enormous role. And I think that's right. I mean, my reading of the, both the edge, educational development and the science development is it's more bottom up than top down and the states have facilitated it they've gone along with it they've bought into it um they've rationalized it they've made it their own project of course claim the credit for the opportunities they're creating for everyone but basically it's been driven by outside their their domain outside their strategic domain and the and the and the ideology of knowledge economy um, and human capital theory, which is just a narrative, really, not a good description of what happens in the economy at all, uh, have been have been have been state ideologies which explain and justify policies of a particular kind and ways of framing those expansions in a particular way. Um, now, the, for example, this swing to STEM is very very strong now. Both east and west uh, governments are emphasising STEM, STEM, STEM. But there's no evidence that that's actually economically rational, that STEM graduates, with some exceptions, are being paid on the whole much more than others, or that um, that it's um, that, that STEM is sort of necessary to the political economy, to capitalist accumulation, in the way in which it's being framed. I mean, clearly, pockets of STEM, high, high school STEM labour are absolutely essential to capitalism, and the cutting edge of competition is being fought in technologically advanced areas. But that doesn't mean that the general that there's a general shift necessary to stem across the whole economy. Um, we do know that a lot of governments would like less critical social science and humanities, um, but um, you know, but that's a kind of political problem, isn't it, rather than a than an economic one. So I think that you know, I mean, I, I think you know, the political economy is there, but the reading of it that that both the mainstream and some of the critical school use is, I think, too limited, too superficial. Um, it's probably another paper. Um, you know, the discussion with you, I think, is another another discussion, if you like, because you've brought into a lot of elements apart from science. But I, I think what we all need to think about, those of us who've got long memories, and some like Christian who read their way into long memories very effectively, I think, um, you know, is what happened in the second half of the 90s, you know, because there was a really big shift then. This was the high point of Anglo-American neoliberal globalisation rolling out everywhere. Um, affecting everything, the politics of everything else, shaping everything. But at that time, you see this enormous surge of popular participation in higher education. In many countries, you see this sudden jump in the participation rate between 95 and 1998 or nine. Really big upward shift taking place in many places. Not governments, but something else is happening there. 
and it's the same time that the global science system really kicks in. So yes, I think the two are related and I think they're probably related to what's happened to mass higher education and the way that's evolved as well and the institutional structure of it and the way in which it absorbs more resources than it used to in economies and so on. But uh, there's clearly something at work which I think can't be simply explained by the narrative of human capital theory or the K economy. Thank you. Uh, Christian uh, Shin, would you like to add something? All right. Uh, then uh, we have um, uh, also a question from Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel, if you would like to pose yours, now's the time. Thank you. First of all, thank you all of you for very inspiring uh, presentation and uh, responses uh, uh, to uh, various comments. And I have a question regarding multilingualism. Mm. Uh, the majority of papers uh, in such countries like Poland or Czech Republic is published in local languages, uh, even in STEM fields. And uh, it was an image presented by Scientometrics for many years. But actually what uh, we were able to show recently using national databases instead of Web of Science or Scopus is that, that majority of researchers even in, in social sciences in those countries, published in at least two languages, often mm. three and more languages. And I look into this um, issue of multilingualism uh, because I also I also uh, I am a co-founder of the Helsinki Initiative of Multilingualism, and we look into various countries uh, how they motivate and why they motivate researchers for publishing in more languages. And for instance, in Finland, in uh, which you mentioned, even in social sciences, there is a lack of publications in Finnish. On the contrary, in Ukraine, more publications in English would be welcome. Thus, uh, mm. my question is uh, regarding to your understanding of multilingualism. Whether for you, multilingualism is a practice when we as academics or publishers make possible translations from various languages into other languages? Or rather, uh, do you think that multilingualism is a practice when researchers publish their research in more than one language? I'm asking about this because the first approach does not solve issues from Finland. There is a lack of publications in Finnish and those publications reproduce cultural background. The second approach, that is, uh, when uh, when researchers publish in more languages, it might be difficult in social sciences, uh, in such countries in which local language is to some extent international language, like uh, in Latin America, you mentioned, uh, or in Arabic countries. So how do you think uh, multilingualism actually work or should work? Shin, do you want to go first and I'll follow you? Thank you, um, Amanu, for your question. A really good question. And um, I was thinking about the two types of uh, multilingual publishing practices that you were talking about. And I, my impression is that both of them may have some um, limitations because even if a multilingual scholar uh, that can work with different languages, there will be essentially something lost in the switching of the codes in writings and in the interpretations of the knowledges. Mm. For instance, um, for me, I write in both Chinese and English, but it's sometimes really hard to find the perfectly corresponding concepts in each of the cultures. So whichever language I write in, there will always be something missing. So whether I publish first in English and then translate it into Chinese or I publish both in Chinese and English may serve what looks to me might be <laughs> ending the same, having the same outcome. Um, and also I'm thinking the questions about whether uh, scholars could publish in different languages or is conditioned by the scientists themselves because now all scientists are multilingual and there are scientists who, who, who only work with one 
language, and for them, the translations will be necessary, and the translations of their publications will be necessary. Um, that's my thinking at the moment, and perhaps Simon will have other mm. comments too. Just to say it's discipline specific to some extent, isn't it? So that, mm. you know, when you're talking about um, a um, technical report, maybe it's going to translate, uh, probably be easier to translate. And probably you can think of the ideal of a single body of knowledge, which could work in different codes, you know. But when you're writing about a social theory problem, I mean, you're writing about culture, uh, you know, it's culturally nuanced. And, and an example of this is that I've been working with a, with my former doctoral student now, um, postdoc uh, Lily Yang, on the comparison between uh, the Anglo-American and Chinese view of the public role, common good role of higher education. And Chris, Christian's also involved in this work as well. And what we've found is that if you have a conversation in Chinese, you, you talk about one set of things. And if you have a conversation in English, you talk about another set of things. And I mean, there's some really interesting ways in which for me as an English language speaker, the Chinese concepts open up new doors and you know new possibilities, new ideas, new ways of seeing this. And to some extent, you can bring that into English too, of course. Um, but uh, but the more important point probably is that you would just see the world differently in each case and open up different sensibilities. And so it, you, the ideal of, of, a, of a single body of knowledge that will just code switch between languages doesn't apply here. And so I think in that sense, the answer is the plurality, you know, in, in relation to Emmanuel's question, you know, both kinds of um, activity are really necessary in different contexts and sometimes the same context. So, I mean, those who work multilingually, I think I've, I've got a tremendous uh, resource and that they've got different ways of imagining things, uh, which will some extent will, you know, those different lenses will create different outcomes and different sensibilities. Um, but we also need that process of translating all our different languages into each other um, so that we can just maximize the flow of knowledge and, and information. Okay, uh, thank you for your answers. Um, uh, now uh, I would like to um, run voice to Ola for the final question. So Ola, please uh, pose yours. Yeah, I would just like to piggyback on the, just the conversation that was happening. I'm, by the way, I'm Ola, I'm the uh, resident applied linguist here in the scholarly communication research group. So I, I work a lot with thinking, uh, thinking about what it means to be writing in different languages. But I also have a, a, a background, uh, graduate education from the United States. And maybe I have a question for Shin actually, because we've been talking about multilingualism so much and these conversations often focus on maybe the burden of uh, second language writers that you know, like we need to learn both in, or write both in English and in our first language, but, but really the, one of the problems is uh, the monolingualism and the myth of monolingualism in the United States and the, in the UK and how it translates also into graduate education and um, education of scientists because um, you know they 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 are focusing um, a lot on uh, becoming competent in, in science or, or producing science in English, and really the the state of foreign language education, um, especially in the United States, is is, is tragic really. <laughs> so so the position even of foreign language education is so small and it's really not talked as as important. Um, and and Shin, you mentioned in one of the slides um, uh, the habits of, of scientists themselves. Um, and maybe my question would be, how do you see um, incentivizing monolingual uh, scholars who work in the center to, to, um, to engage maybe more into multilingual practices? And, um, and this also maybe in the context of the hegemony because like they are on the top of, um, you know, it's, it's asking for more labor of people who don't really need to perform that labor. So, um, so it's just, that is my just general question. Like how, how do we yes. not only focus on, on um, alto writers and, and multilingual scholars, but think about those uh, monolingual scholars. Thank you very much, Ola. I think that's a really important question that you've raised uh, because there are, as we say, different groups of scholars, some are multilingual, some are um, non-lingual, and for the non-lingual scholars, some are English speakers and some are like other 
language speakers, which are not, which is not the lingua franca of the global science. Um, my own understanding is that for the English speaking group of academics, there should be, um, I don't know if it's, it can be termed as a fundamental change of mindset, but um, I think there should be a um, change of perception of the English prim primacy of the, the sense of the primacy associated with the English language. And this was evident in, 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 in various ways, some subtle than others, for instance, in the peer reviewing processes. Um, we often, or we could see comments from English, native English speakers saying, oh, this text, this text need to be fixed and this is not perfect English. But I mean, this kind of comment, I don't think is, is necessary <laughs> or uh, legitimate. You could, you, you could say that this text need to be proofread, but the judgment would not be made based on the other academics capacity of their English speaking or of their English language. So this kind of uh, respect and also acknowledgement of the, the variety of knowledges and the variety of the cultures that are outside the English speaking world, I think is kind of necessary. And also I felt perhaps as monolingual speakers, it, um, there are actually some limitations in their imaginations and in their in the in, in the kind of knowledge and culture that they they can access to and approach, um, and this may be asymmetrical and may be I don't know perceived as uh, unfortunate to some, uh, and but I don't think this kind of idea is widely accepted or acknowledged by normal lingual speakers. So that's my um, understandings of this. Um, okay, uh, any further comments by, by uh, Professor Marginson or, or Christian to the, to the all council question? Oh, just to thank everyone for their, um, you know, for their really great questions and um, the discussion has been really fruitful and has made us, I think, think a bit further about a number of things, which is really good. Uh, we look forward to a further exchange and discussion at another at a future time on these issues and other issues all right so uh, i would like to once again thank you very much for accepting our invitation and um, contributing to the to our series series by by bringing your uh, research uh, into our focus uh, also thank you for christian for um delivering his comments and um introducing us to, to the discussion and uh, now I would like to um, take an opportunity uh, and just finally make one remark uh, this was the second seminar in the series but in May on May 11th uh, we will held another seminar a third seminar in our series and this time we will have a special guest from Argentina, uh, Leandro Rodriguez Medina, who will um, tell us something about centers and peripheries in the production of social science knowledge. So uh, you are all very welcome to join us for um, this seminar. Uh, and we hope that uh, we will see each other and uh, continue this um, conversation that we just starting, uh, but, but um, it definitely has potential to translate into um, into future conversations and debates. So please remember about the um, first seminar and join us. Jo join us for the next meeting. Once again, very big thanks for our guests and for all the audience. Mm -hmm. That would be all for today's seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you.